Chairman of Social Mitra, distinguished uh, members on the dais, and friends. Uh, when I was first invited to come and lecture uh, in this, on this August occasion in the celebrations of the 135th anniversary of the Calcutta Port Trust, Kolkata Port Trust, I felt both honored and intimidated. The honor is obvious. The intimidation is due to the fact that basically I am a land lover. That is to say, I really don't know very much about uh, shipping beyond the fact that I must be, uh, apart from Professor Mitra, one of the few people who made the journey by ship to England and back. And that too, in my case, in 1939, when we came back uh, in one of the last destroyer convoys that came through the Mediterranean after the Second World War started. And the journey by ship, of course, is a wonderful experience. But beyond that, I really have no knowledge about the problems, the technical problems that a port faced. But I thought this was a challenge, and uh, uh, I felt tempted to try my ignorance out on the very many distinguished people here who have served the Calcutta port in various capacities in all, in throughout these uh, last, uh, what, uh, 20 to 50 years of the end of the uh, 20th century. The port, of course, goes back much further than 135 years. The chairman, Dr. Chandok, has very lucidly and with admirable brevity made clear to you what the principal features of the past are and what he thinks are the future. Dr. Mitra, uh, with whom I am immensely proud to be on the same dais, uh, first of all, uh, please do not forget anything that he said beyond the few sentences at the beginning about me, because uh, I would like to uh, share with you the knowledge that I went to the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta, purely uh, due to his kindness and uh, friendship uh, for me. And I have had the singular privilege of uh, working for two or three years in the same room as him in the old buildings of the Institute of Management in Emerald Bar. And it was he who introduced me many years later to the problems of West Bengal at the ground level by sort of inducting me as honorary state editor of the West Bengal District Gazetteers. And I'm very proud to be on the same dais with him. He has given you another point of view. <coughs> We have here the basics of what could be a discussion on the future of Kolkata port. A discussion on whether in the last resort the port will stagnate or whether the port has within itself the capacity to innovate, transform and change towards a more growth-oriented pattern. And there I'm talking of what Dr. Mitra said was Kolkata as distinct from Holbia. We have the makings of a discussion here. It would be good if this discussion can continue beyond this hall among the officers and the staff of the Kolkata Port Trust and among the wider user public. What I thought I would do is also give you a background about certain imminent constraints in the development of the many anchorages that make up the entire port. Because this, after all, is what the broad concept of the port of Kolkata is. The anchorages begin 
in North Calcutta. What used to be known as Dihi Kolikata, which was on the river bank and behind which, to the east of which, lay Bajar Kolikata. The two settlements where Job Chanak did not land. He landed incidentally at Shutanat. He, his pilot steered him by an ancient banyan tree, which may have been in Ahiritola Ghat, or one of the ghats just to the north of Ahiritola. And he died in Shutanati. He did not even die in Kolikata. Uh, his body was removed by his uh, son-in-law, Sir Charles, uh, Charles Ayer, to where it now reposes in St. John's churchyard near the old Dalhousie Square. But I'm talking of Dihi Kolikata. I was really interested to find in one of the books, one of the two books that the Port Commissioners have published on the history of the Port Trust. The second one, edited by Shottesh Chakravarti, which is called 125 Years. There is an article by Mr. P. T. Nair, Kappan Nair, who is a chronicler of the Calcutta streets, who says without any references, without any footnotes, without any source material in that book, that originally there was a creek which was dug into a canal which ran along what was then called the Bankshal, which later silted up and was turned into Bankshal Street by the 18th century. And apparently this led to the Lal Dikhi, which is later to be called the Great Tank and was briefly Dalhousie Square. If that is so, then Fort William had a canal uh, running from west towards the eastern levee, which banks the east bank of Kolkata. And ships, according to Thankarpan Naya, were actually brought into the Laldivi. Whether this is right or wrong, I don't know. Uh, our very good friend, Shottish Chakravarti, in his uh, introductory, uh, in his lecture last year, the keynote address, has referred to this as if it is a fact. I would be very interested to know what the source material is, what the archival uh, proof of this is. But it spotlights a point, which is that apart from the Hooghly River, there have always been distributaries known as creeks running eastwards from the Hooghly. Another such creek doesn't exist anymore, but all the 19th century histories of Kolkata mention this, that this is commemorated today in a street called Creek Row. Many of us who have occasion to go to North Kolkata know this because of the one-way system. You go to Dharamtala and then just north of Dharamtala Street, you turn left into Creek Row and come out at what used to be Wellington Square, Azad in Bagh, and then by Hin Cinema, you go up the College Street line all the way to Shambhala. It is said that in the early 18th century, there were boats which were washed up where Creek Row now is a narrow little lane. But beyond that then, is another creek which runs from the river uh, Hooghly and that is Tolly's Nala. Tolly, Colonel Tolly was an Englishman who according to the histories, all the histories, was the first man to think of building docks. So he dug uh, that uh, little creek which now is called the Abhigonga and runs uh, below what is today the Taj Mahal, the, 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 the Taj Hotel, over which goes the Zirat Bridge and uh, the other one. And although he was not able to complete the docks, there was an attempt to complete them by a man called Watson and his sons. And it is this dock which is commemorated now, once again in a street name like Creek Row, Watganj Street. Watgun Street is the main entrance 
towards the garden rich area. So this is a point that is worth remembering when one thinks of the fact that the first anchorage in what is today Kolkata was from roughly the region where the present Howrah Bridge now stands. If you look at the other book, the earlier book that uh, the Port Commissioners brought out in the late 1960s in Mr. V.B. Ghosh's time as chairman, my good friend Nilmoni Mukherjee's book on the history of the Calcutta port, you will find there a map which is at the back and it opens out. It's an old map, slightly pre-independence, which gives all the moorings, about 20 I think if one counts them, which have then berths along jetties all the way from where the present customs warehouses now are down to what is called uh, the Calcutta moorings and then the Hastings moorings opposite the Hastings area just ahead of Tully's Mala. I mention this because when I was a boy during the Second World War my father used to take my mother and me in our old uh, Austin, uh, in his old Austin number 12 to the river bank for a walk at least three or four days in the week and the car would be parked at a place which I was surprised to find even Port Commissioner staff don't recall now anymore because the Marine Headquarters has taken it up. We would park near the Laskar Memorial, the ornate tower which commemorates the work of the Laskars who were the ship's uh, workers and who died during the First World War. Uh, it's a rather superb piece of architecture which you can see only now from the new uh, bridge, uh, Vivekananda Setu or whatever it's called now. But it's a rather remarkable piece of architecture which should have been protected as a heritage monument uh, by intact when they did up the Princep Ghat. And from the Laskar Memorial, where there is the, I think, the Takta Ghat, it used to be called the Takta Ghat, where the good ship Maharaja used to birth, uh, coming from the Andamans and then going back. From there, all the way to Uttram Ghat, through even the Second World War years, and for three or four years after that, up to the 1950s, there would be ships moved all along the line. My memory of the Hooghly River is of a river full of ships. And I have often wondered what happened to those ships. Why did there suddenly occur a falling off through the 50s so that when I came back after studying outside Kolkata to work in this city in 1961, I found that there were practically no ships at all. You had a clear view across to the dead derelict warehouses on the other side of the river. I have been told uh, by the, the very helpful and learned members of uh, the staff here, uh, the officers here, that one of the reasons, and I presume the only the big reason was, that all along the river, behind the jetties, particularly on the Howrah side, were factories, jute mills, principally, along the foreshore road, and then on the other side of Howrah Station, a place which I have uh, very uh, pleasant memories of, the Golabari, <coughs> the long, low, flat godowns of Howrah, just ahead of Shalkia, this side, towards uh, Howrah, where in the 1950s, uh, friends of mine, uh, someone called Shombit Chatterjee and his younger brother, whose name everyone here knows, Shomitra Chatterjee, used to live with their father who was the master of the salt golas, G-O-L-L-A-H-S, it was spelled. And the salt would be unloaded in the gola bodies. The jute would be loaded on and I presume there were tea sheds uh, also. 
Now, these were commodities which suddenly slumped after the partition that the British imposed on India in the year 1947. Apart from the many natural causes, and Dr. Mitra has very correctly identified those first of all, apart from the siltage of the river, one of the big blows to Kolkata as a port, and I'm now not talking of Bolivia, Kolkata as a port was the blow given by the partition of Bengal. Whatever happened to the jute industry, at any rate, the movements shifted towards Narayan Ganj for several years. Whatever happened to the salt trade was taken away by a shift in the policy of transportation, according to which it moved from river to rail, so that rail made the big movements of salt. And as regards tea, we know the history. <coughs> The fact of the creation of East Pakistan and then its succession into Bangladesh meant that the traffic down the Brahmaputra Jamuna system up to Gualando and then through what we remember, those of us who are old enough to remember, what we remember as the inner channel or even the outer channel through the Shundarbans going past Borishal towards Kulna and then by Shathira uh, down the river and up towards the Hogli, this was completely disrupted. Throwing out of gear, companies like the River Steam Navigation, the I, I think it was called the IGNNR uh, company, uh, the River Steam Navigation Company. The independence of Burma which came at the same time from the British Empire only uh, solidified what had begun in 1935 when Burma was made a crown colony outside the scope of British India's purview. This meant, A, of course, uh, a difference in the pattern of the rice trade which had been, been initially disrupted in the Second World War and which now was consumed by the home market uh, uh, Obama. It meant a complete disruption of the Rangoon Kolkata port uh, trade. And in general, it meant a decline in the traditional industries of Bengal. Industries which had not been very much capital forming, industries which had been based indeed on very considerable exploitation of the primary producers, whether the tea garden labor or the jute cultivating peasants of East Bengal, or, and I have not mentioned that, the coal industry, where, where there were dismal conditions in the industry. But for whatever value they had, they had created the pattern of the base of the industries of Bengal on which there had been reared a certain structure of engineering related largely to the railways, but also uh, to the port to some extent, not to that extent, but to uh, some extent, where in machine tools, in mechanical work, on the other side of the river from Kolkata and Howrah, there had been the clangor of tools which one could hear as one came from Dashnagar to Ramrajatala into Howrah station and which continued in the very famous machine tools workshops of Belilios Road and similar areas of Howrah. When one talks of the decrepitude of Kolkata port at a certain point of time, I was talking to a very senior member uh, of uh, the trust, uh, the, just before the lecture and he told me he had joined in 1972 and I said that must have been at the Nadi of the port. He said yes, the, the, those were very dark years and one thought twice about uh, one's job in those days. I'm sure it needed an act of faith for people to stay on in the port. 
when one talks of that, one has to see it as part of the general collapse of Kolkata. Dr. Mitra has mentioned to you the freight rates uh, equalization policy by which regional imbalances were supposed to be uh, removed. And when this regional imbalance was removed, no one bothered about the fact that a regional imbalance had been created for West Bengal by the partition itself. In the removal of regional imbalances, a large number of ports on the west coast of India, as well as Vaisagapatam, as well as the newer and smaller port of Paradip came up and developed in terms of equality of market choices. As a result of which, and along with the uh, general attack on Kolkata in terms of the historical uh, developments, there was a shift of capital away from Kolkata. So that the condition of the port has to be seen as a part of the condition of Kolkata as a whole. I wouldn't go so far as to make the metaphor that Dr. Pratap Chandra Chandar has made in his wisdom in the book on 125 years of Kolkata port, the first article, where he says that uh, the port and the city were Siamese twins, uh, which were hardly separated. Well, I don't know about uh, that, but it is certainly true that when the port trust was set up for two years, the idea was that it would be run by the municipal corporation. And it was only by special legislation that the port trust was set up with its own purposes in view. That is the first point that I wish to make. That while Kolkata is a set of anchorages which have moved southwards, as has been pointed out to you, all the way from the customs house, the screw pile jetty area, to what I know of as King George's dock, but I now find that uh, according to our usual practice, of heaping all the name changes on one or two devoted figures. Uh, King George's Dock is now called Netaji Shubhash Dock. We have an amplitude of Netaji Shubhash uh, transportation terminals in our city. Uh, all the way from the customs house area to the Netaji Shubhash Dock area, the anchorages have shifted south. And it is only a logical development, as has been said before today, that the port is uh, shifting itself towards Haldia. And in an attempt to obviate what people call the bends, bores, and bars of the river, the shift will finally take place, according to projections, to Diamond Harbor and even further southwards, towards Sagar. But, the point still remains. These anchorages are all anchorages of a river which is in a process of change and decay. How does one handle that aspect? I am addressing myself to that particular question that Dr. Ashok Mitra has raised. Let us look at Calcutta as distinct from Haldia for hypothetical. <coughs> The glory of the last two or three years, the remarkable and laudable change that has taken place in the traffic of Kolkata, includes the fact of the existence of Holbia. Supposing one leaves the seaward, southward shift out, is there any possibility of reversing the trend according to which in the 1970s and 1980s, we thought of the decrepitude of Kolkata itself as a port. Now to start with, hydrographically speaking, the Hooghly River is a river which should be seen as distinct from the Bhagirathi. We learn in school, we teach our children, that Hogli Bhagirathi Aki Nodinna. 
I was looking at an article by I think uh, engineer, a river engineer called uh, Donnell or O'Donnell in the 125 year centenary volume uh, who was uh, attached to the port commissioners and who later became or at least five years ago was Professor Emeritus of Hydrology in Manchester. And he has shown in certain detail that the Bhagirathi as a distributary of the river Ganges has got entangled with what is known as the Nadia river system. The Mathabhanga and the Jalangi, lower distributaries, all of which have tied up together and gone in for river capture in a big way, as happens in uh, uh, del del estuary and deltas. This river capture has meant that the flow of the Ganga, which is depleting as we know and as has been mentioned, has meant that the Bhagirathi itself is a very narrow river. How narrow, I recall uh, seeing with horror and surprise, about 42 years ago, in 1963, I had occasion to go and lecture in Bharampur College, Krishnath College in Bharampur. And I was taken by rickshaw from Bharampur to Moshidabad because I wanted to go and see where the Nawabs lived. If you go to the Hazrat, uh, uh, the, to the, 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 the big palace of the Nawabs, the 19th century, Palace of the Nawabs in Murshidabad, and you go across, you will find that the Bhagirathi flows past it. And I was really surprised to see that the great Bhagirathi, beside whose banks I had grown up, was just a narrow little nala, which flowed roughly from this table up to the wall there. And uh, a, a, a veteran jumper could e easily uh, Cold water across uh, the Bhagirathi there, and the water level was very low. I don't know what the situation is now, but I doubt if the Bhagirathi has really expanded itself. The article I'm referring to in your centenary history of the Port Commissioners makes the point that south of Katwa, the river broadens out. And where it flows past what used to be Adi Shaptagram, what still remains a church at Bandel, which Bandel is a Portuguese corruption of Bandar, and what is Hogli, there the river is much broader. I wouldn't vouch for this, my knowledge is not uh, of that depth whatsoever, but I imagine that the tides come up, not up to Hooghly anymore, I'm sure, but pretty much up the river. And it is clear that the tidal portion of the distributary of the Ganga is quite different in its development and in its pattern and in its uh, morphology from the Bhagirathi itself. I imagine this has been caused by the rivers on the east bank, sorry, the west bank of the Hooghly. The Ojoy Moyurakhi, which comes down near Katwa, and then the Shoroshati, which has lost itself in the Amta area in Haura, and finally, the Damodar, which still used to exist, and it was used. To, it used to be called the Kana Damodar below Uberia, when we crossed it uh, going on the Bengal Nagpur railway line. But which today you can hardly see the, even the Kana Damodar, and then the rivers Mundeshwari and uh, Rupnarayan, which have river captured the Damodar and have dried up that whole swampy tract of Hara and southern Hooghly uh, districts. It is significant that many of the great bars that make pilotage on the Hooghly, such a tricky and uh, uh, technical business, have been created perhaps 
because of the inflow of silt from these lower tributaries of the Hokli. And I'm told that even in uh, uh, Holdia, the Nagar that is coming up is something that is being created by the inflow of water from, I forget the, the I, I think it is the Holdi River, if I'm not wrong. If, but in terms of more highways coming into Kolkata's port system, and here, I'm sorry, I have to think of Kolkata and Holdia as a part. More railroad linkages, these perhaps exist. If I'm uh, uh, saying things which already exist, please correct me afterwards. But if they do not exist, is it not necessary for us to think of a transportation model <coughs> which includes a massive increase of traffic from the north bank of the Ganga all the way from Basti, Baraich and Gonda in Uttar Pradesh through Mujafparpur and Mithila, which crosses by the bridge over the Ganga, north of uh, uh, Patna, or a bit to the uh, east of Patna. Is it not possible to think of improvements in goods movements from northeast India? Is it not possible to include the feasibility of more traffic from Nepal and Bhutan. Immediately people will point out, aha, once again you are going into the realm of political decision making. And a political decision making which is completely uncertain given the fact that we have, uh, 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 to put, not to uh, put it too exaggeratedly, a most unnatural dynasty which has uh, massacred democracy in Nepal and a small state where there may be potentials in work on timber and power but where there is a certain isolationist tendency, the case of Bhutan. Are we not excluding the possibility of political uncertainty, the lack of political stability hampering the sort of economic development which had begun in Nepal and which has begun again to be a bit wary given the development of violence along the Tarai region of Nepal. Yes, well, one always calculates with uncertainty when one thinks of any pattern of development. It is just the point that if Kolkata port has to develop, then it will have to think not only of the tremendous development of containerization, ease of movement, uh, shortening of turnaround time, better clearing facilities, all these have existed, they have uh, taken place as the chairman pointed out, one has to move further from that. Whatever the southward movement, whatever the movement towards uh, the sea, Kolkata will never compete with Colombo or Singapore. There is a certain limit uh, to the capacity of an, even a tidal uh, river port as compared with the sea, open sea ports of the west coast or even of Vizag or on the other hand the ports in the Krai, Isthmus, and the Malaysian Peninsula. So, if one thinks of alternatives, I would uh, suggest that one has to think not only of the development of riverborne traffic, but of the development of road, rail, and river cooperation. And a cooperation which also does not uh, neglect the point of the principal advantage that Kolkata port has suddenly rediscovered the advantage of having access to the Indian Ocean. This is the model 
in which the thinking must go forward. I would like to take your indulgence for five to seven minutes more of time only to make a point in which I have some more knowledge. And this is the question of preservation of the heritage of the old elements within the Calcutta Port Trust area. I happen to be connected with the heritage movement in uh, this city for better or for worse. And I remember that when uh, two or three of us were doing the work relating to the listing of the heritage buildings of Kolkata, which were later notified by the municipal corporation, we had said that the port area should be listed as a heritage zone. When you list some part of a city as a heritage zone, this does not mean that you cannot uh, redevelop within it. It only means that it would be useful if all old buildings of any significance vis-a-vis -vis architecture, vis-a-vis -vis aesthetic beauty, and also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, relationship with eminent personalities are listed and described and photographed as they are. It means that a category be imputed to such buildings, A or B class, that is high preservation necessity and lower preservation necessity. And it means that these categories be respected when development goes on, if possible by maintaining the outer facade. I'm sorry to say that the, uh, the, the Kolkata Municipal Corporation Heritage Committee, of which I have been a member since its inception, has done nothing except consider uh, applications for declassification of buildings. But someone can begin. And the Port Trust has that tradition of being a cognate organization which has preserved heritage buildings. I'm sure that the buildings in Portland Park deserve preservation in one way or another, as the buildings of the old uh, Bengal Assam Railway quarters in Belvedere Park on Belvedere Road deserve similar presentation, or as Mr. Bhandari is trying to preserve and create heritage awareness for the historic buildings in uh, Garden Ridge such as the general manager's bungalow, uh, inhabited once by Lord Inchcape or McKinnon Mackenzie, and previous to that built in Wajid Ali Shah's times, or the Godfrey mansions one and two, remarkable examples of mansion building in old colonial Calcutta. I'm sure that the Port Trust can do something in this direction. I say this because having been taken recently on a visit to Netaji Shuvash Dock, I came across the old clock tower, a very elegant piece of architecture which could easily beat the Ghandaghar of Allahabad in terms of beauty. Everyone talks of the Ghandaghar in uh, Allahabad, but then only when they want to go and eat <coughs> a very dirty kebabs beneath it. No one really takes notice of the clock tower which was used to keep time for the whole of the old King George's uh, dock. There is a notice uh, affixed to it which is difficult to read or at least my eyesight is bad but others also found it difficult to read it so high up. Some signage on these buildings would be interesting. The port has some of the fine old red brick buildings, which were once a mark, a hallmark of old Kolkata. Most of the red brick buildings, including the one in which I was born on Theatre Road, have been pulled down to build the very ugly Shakespeare Sharani. At least some of these old red brick buildings could be identified, placarded, and treated with whatever care or concern that the Port Trust believes that they deserve. 
Similarly, I remember feeling very sorry about 10-15 uh, years ago. I was approached by the then river surveyor who told me that he had under his care some of the very old and beautifully painted river maps of the Hubli. <coughs> it was suggested to him at that juncture that he could work through the Victoria Memorial for their uh, good preservation because they seem to be in a state of uh, decay. And these were very, very valuable maps of the Hooghly. The Hooghly may have changed its course since then. They may have developed shows. But these were historical records of 18th and 19th century cartography, which certainly de deserve preservation by the Victoria Memorial. But then came uh, a very senior officer, uh, Dr. Roy, who decided that no, no, the Victoria Memorial should have nothing to do with it. The Port Trust would look after its own materials. And I doubt whether these maps are known to those interested in the history, either of cartography or of the river. In many old institutions of imperial vintage, such as the Port Trust, there are many elements which deserve commemoration. The other day when I went to Netaji Shubhash Dock, uh, the officer who very kindly showed me around, uh, showed me the area where the ships enter the dock from the river, where the lock gates are. And uh, pointing at the, the brickwork, which over, on either side of the lock gates, he said, Shaibra idharne jinish kore gye chilo, amra parvo ki na jani na. Tabe amra aapana toiri kori ni idharne jinish shamprati. That I think is the point. We can do it. But why not preserve what was done earlier? No matter whether the shaibs did it or the non-shaibs uh, did it. So this is just a plea on the side for preservation of that part of the past of the port that the port considers worth preserved. It is always good to plan for the future. But quite often when we plan for the future, we write an old history which we then forget. I wonder if there are many among you who have re read uh, Nilmani Mukherjee's very lucid panegyric of the way the port was built. All I am asking for is that keep note of the past and on the basis of the constraints of the past, work out what is feasible for the future. That feasibility requires research, it requires planning, but it also requires a certain courageous vision, a vision which will be broad and which will take into note the fact that our futures are not politically even fixed. There are going to be changes. How do we visualize those changes and what part will be played by the port in those changes as we visualize them over the next 20 years? Thank you.
Madhushanga Brahma, daughter of Sri Parthushar Mission 2005, conducted by the West Bengal Board of Secondary Education. She is the topper among the recipients of merit award in Odiyada Complex for achieving excellence in secondary examination 2005. She appeared in the examination from St. Louis School, Haldia. Vishwadeep Shorkar, Son of Sri Bijan Kumar Sarkar, Assistant Traffic Officer of Traffic Railway Division of Aliyadad Complex. He secured 91.87% marks with the latest in seven subjects in secondary examination 2005 conducted by West Bengal Board of Secondary Education. He appeared from St. Louis School High School in Aliyadad. He is the top one of the boys in Aliyadad who are recipients of merit award. Next is Ms. Shonjita Mollik, daughter of Sri Sholilindranath Mollik, 2005, conducted by the West Bengal Council of Higher Secondary Education. He appeared from St. Lawrence High School. Not only is the topper among the boys in KDS, he is the topper among, the, among all the recipients of merit award in KDS and HTC together for achieving excellence in Higher Secondary Examination 2005. Next is Ms. Monoshita Gupta, Division of Haldiada Complex, secured 89.2% marks with latest in four subjects in high school education in 2005. She is the topper in HDC among the recipients of merit award for achieving excellence in high school examination in 2005. She appeared from St. Louis High School. Sri Utsrap Sinha, son of Sri Devo, 0.3% marks with latest in four subjects in high school examination 2005, conducted by the Osborne Council of High School Education. He is the top the boys in HBC who are recipients of Merit Award. He appeared from St. Louis High School in Helga. As Miss Shum in KDS, secured 84.3% marks with latest in three subjects in high school examination 2005. She is the top one among the girls in KDS who are recipients of Merit Award for achieving excellence in high school examination 2005. She appeared from St. John's Diocesan Girls High School, Poland. Thank you.